This is Asia's Farm to Fork Five Good Questions podcast, bringing you insights and views from across Asia's food value chain. Now for today's interview. Hi, everybody. This is Duke Hip, host of Asia's Farm to Fork Five Good Questions podcast, and uh, we're beginning the uh, season two of the podcast today. We're very uh, excited about having a special guest with us to uh, to get things started. Joining us is Professor Salvador Catello. He's with the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at the College of Economics and Management at the University of the Philippines in Los Banos, or uh, UPLB. Professor, how's it going? Hello, everything is okay and fine. Thank you. How about right. you? All good. We're excited about having the, the new season, and we're, we're very excited about having you uh, help us get things started. So if that's okay, we'll, we'll jump right in, and, and I'll give you the first question. Maybe uh, get things started with a, a tough subject. I'm talking about inflation and, and high food prices, which really are prevalent around the region and around the world, but particularly, I think it's fair to say, in the Philippines. Uh, in a recent Philippines Food and Security Monitoring Report by the World Food Program, or FWFP, it was noted that households in the Philippines are really most concerned about increasing food prices more than anything else. Not surprising, really, given how expensive everyday food items and items such as onions and so forth that have really risen in recent uh, in recent months. Question for you is this, is the, is the current spike in food prices reflective of a new normal in the Philippines and around the region, or do you think this is sort of something that will be some, seen come down in the, in the weeks ahead and, and uh, it really sort of stabilize? Okay, thank you uh, for that question. Yeah, you're right uh, in saying that this is a little bit tough. But before I respond to this question, allow me to set my uh, reference and departure points of discussions. Uh, generally, the increase in food prices in the past was a confluence of many factors that included COVID-19. We have this Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the after effects of economic stimulus, and uh, the spillover effects of continuing market inefficiencies in the supply chain. Now, concerning COVID-19, it has practically affected the regional production and post-production operations, the flow and cost of transport, modality of distribution, and the structure and volume of demand. Actually, the pandemic has slowed down supply and has disrupted the regional and global supply chains as well. The demand for commodities under the work from home and then this one home quarantine atmosphere was not matched correspondingly by production capacities. This in turn propelled demand pool inflationary effects. Moreover, because of the massive and disparaging socioeconomic effects of the pandemic, well, governments uh, were impelled to provide cash transfers that uh, are aimed to boost soft uh, social safety nets, and uh, also to promote consumption. Economic stimulus packages were also resorted to in order to avert any further economic collapse. With more money in circulation, people essentially had more spending power over the limited consumer goods available in the market. This demonstrates another picture of inflationary effect. As the global economy started to recover from the pandemic, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia resulted to far-reaching economic consequences as financial markets tumbled and prices of oil surged. It must be recalled that Russia is considered as one of the largest suppliers of gas and oil in the EU, while Ukraine is one of the producers of important agricultural products, such as cereals, we have wheat, corn, barley, and uh, sunflower oil. This suggests that the crump in the supply of oil meant higher prices of oil and consequently higher production costs, more expensive transport costs, and consumer prices. On the other hand, the cut in Ukraine's productions limited its supply to import-dependent countries. So uh, basically, the situation added pressure on the global oil and gas market, as well as on the food security of a number of importing countries that had been already debilitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So I suppose the situation is another case of inflationary. Now, with respect to your question on whether the current spike in prices is reflective of a new normal in the Philippines and around the region, well, I would say that price increases will subsist if shortage in supply continues in the market. 
the reversal of the situation will depend on how the agricultural sector bounces back and how the market margins can be reduced. This is why we need to prime up farming as a backbone of the economy and source of livelihood, especially of smallholders. It should be complemented by efficiency gain in the domestic and regional supply chains. For the meantime, the provision of economic stimulus to protect the poor and sustain the livelihood of the farmers would be a good move. To reiterate, it is always the poor that is hard hit by spikes in prices. As to your next question, if I can see the prices coming down in the weeks and months ahead, well, uh, I'm tempted to be more of a pessimist for now. The situation would depend on how quick economies can fix the after effects of the COVID-19 and the spillover effects of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Central to this is the stabilization of the global supply of oil and gas and sufficiency of agricultural commodities for trade. Obviously, these are not realistic occurrences in the immediate future, like in a month's time or so. The issue of uh, onion prices in the Philippines the past three months is a different story. We have recently witnessed the price levels reestablish after the abnormality in supply was corrected. So these onions uh, that normally pass through a value chain, well, like, uh, it can be likened to a flight that has layovers. The flight may face delay somewhere for some reasons. However, if the cause of delay were promptly and properly addressed, the flight reaches its destination with less opportunity cost. One thing is clear from this experience. When farm produce, no matter how big, no matter how huge, fails to reach the final market on time, there is this unwanted distortion in the supply demand situation. This leads to unstable, or even exorbitant retail prices that may prove prejudicial to the interests of consumers. Well, I hope I answered the first question properly. Yeah, thanks, Professor Catello. You absolutely did. That's a great answer and very thorough. And it, it got me thinking about uh, another aspect of this of this whole um, dilemma, and that is uh, the farmer, right? And we talk a lot in this show about the impact of farmers generally uh, around the food value chain, things that are happening, different dynamics. You mentioned COVID. You know, climate change and the conflict in Europe in particular. And in the same report that we just mentioned from the WFP, it also noted that one in 10 Filipino households that are currently food insecure, um, it talks about uh, uh, those that are really most affected by this are coming from agricultural livelihoods uh, more, more than others, more food insecure, unfortunately. So uh, with that in mind, it, the aspect of, again, of the farmer in Asia and the importance of we talk a lot about empowering and enabling farmers to grow more food with fewer resources, less impact to the environment and doing it in a sustainable way, but also about the idea of uh, having you know the right uh, uh, support to these farmers, making sure that they're less vulnerable in situations like this, less uh, vulnerable to food insecurity. So uh, with that in mind, is there more we, we can do, we should be doing uh, collectively to ensure that our region's smallholders in particular have access to the tools that they need? Okay, uh, well, to me, empowering and enabling the farmers is an endless mission when principally poverty continues to prevail in the rural areas and more especially when it has worsened. We can actually always claim that we are doing something for them, but if the outcomes remain below standards and targets in terms of productivity, net income, food security, and environmental protection, among others, it pays always to go back to the drawing board and see the sources of gaps and the need for. To grow more with less requires more intense priming up of the agricultural sector amidst the adversities and challenges. It should not end up with uh, interventions up to the farm gate only, but ensures business continuity until the ultimate consumption points. We have witnessed scores of successes in farming, but uh, were later derailed by the absence or lack of effective strategies beyond the farm. Our steadfast resolve to transform agriculture into a competitive, food secure, resilient, and empowering sector must cover the entire spectrum of the value chain. Not only the usual tools like credit facilities or input pro provisions, but to uh, empower them also to develop and sustain themselves 
from the fruits of modernization and industrialization. Now, what is this modernization and industrialization? So, uh, well, when you speak of modernization, I take it from the viewpoint of uh, a call for more investments on infrastructure, promotion and effective adoption of site-specific technologies, continuous innovation, such as digital agriculture, climate change adaptation and mitigation measures, efficient marketing system, and functional and pro-farmer value chains. Industrialization, on the other hand, includes more efficient inbound and outbound logistics, development and promotion of agro-industrial business corridors, export expansion, and sustainable trade agreements. Directing and enabling our farmers to grow more food with lesser resources through this necessary developmental means could spell the difference in stimulating timely, self-rewarding, and sufficient impacts on the ground. On a more specific perspective, growing more food with lesser resource requires substantial gains in farm productivity. Just to cite one example, the low yield levels in many farms have been attributed in more ways than one to inadequate nutrient application and soil nutrient mis mismanagement. Therefore, ensuring an adequate supply of fertilizer at reasonable prices, enabling farmers to gain more access to fertilizer and uh, well, inducing higher and proper fertilizer application by farmers are requisites. Modern crop varieties are particularly known to be fertilizer responsive, but inadequate in appropriate use of fertilizer result in below potential farm yields and higher per unit cost. With optimal fertilization, the potential impact on yield of the recommended practices can be realized. Hence, scaling up and scaling out of management practices are highly recommended. Basic in all this is the adoption of climate smart agriculture and environment friendly technologies. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Very insightful again. And I'd like, if it's okay, we're moving through these, this discussion, the, these questions. I'd like to stay on the, the topic of the farmer because you, you give me a lot of things here, a lot of food for thought, no, no pun intended. As you know, um, our region is home to the smallest size farms and uh, the largest number of smallholders in the world. Smallholders are really at the center of everything we do with respect to food production. And for these growers, having access to market is important not only for trade, but also for their own and their, their families' livelihoods. So we just touched on how the we're seeing that, that impact, in, and not just in the Philippines, but it affects food security uh, for, for the farmers themselves because of their you know, the, the inter interdependence on uh, on the food production and and their role in that in that equation. So, uh, specifically, look thinking about that and the impact of farmers with food security um, and their own livelihoods. What recommendations might you have for countries in the region um, in helping maintain and grow their competitiveness, access to market, at that sense, in the trade front, particularly in the area of agriculture, food export. Any any things come to mind as far as sort of recommendations or suggestions you might have to to countries in that that area? Uh, well, we know that small uh, smallholder farmers cannot engage in farming as intense and innovative as the heavily endowed commercial farmers, more so when we speak of competing with the giants in the industry. They remain needy of appropriate support from the government and the private sector by a sound macroeconomic environment and institutional reforms. Areas of particular concern include the low capital, we can also speak up uh, the limited land okay, for farming and poorly functioning input and output markets. To help the smallholder farmers maintain or raise their competitiveness and access to market, we have to accept the reality that uh, we have to assist them to make the agriculture sector more profitable and better prepared for global competition. This means that we have to intensify the efforts to address the sources of inefficiencies along the production and marketing continuum and provide necessary support system. A structural shift out of low productivity agriculture to higher productivity and competitive market sector is imperative, I suppose. At the core of this challenge is the packaging and delivery of various credit assistance programs aimed at, among other things, 
using farmers' access to input such, uh, such as fertilizer, seed, farm machinery, water pumps. We're dealing with the uh, crop production, breeding stocks, feeds, veterinary services, and the like when we talk about livestock uh, farming. Farmers must be empowered as entrepreneurs with the aid of broadened access to support services. For instance, to uh, sustainably promote the development and adoption of agricultural technologies, synergies between government agencies, the research and development programs of academic institutions, farmer organizations, and private entities are essential. Central also are, uh, well, uh, efforts to sustain the initiatives of building linkages between farmers and provide training and extension services for them. For their produce to generate more and sustainable income, they should be mainstream in the agri value chains. I should reiterate that the gaps in infrastructure, particularly the road and rail connectivities, as well as in logistics and energy are disruptive and disadvantageous. The absence of functional infrastructure results to significant post-harvest losses. It drives up, uh, well, the transaction cost, and uh, it also renders lower competitiveness. Last but not the least is the effort towards consolidation through cooperative development and promotion. I am a strong advocate of cooperative uh, movement. Success stories speak a lot about the power of cooperative identity and integration. It has catalyzed synergy in purpose, collective membership that translates to enlarged manpower, stronger bargaining power, and more importantly, the sharing not only of resources, but of goods and services to all members as well. The unselfish nature of the coalition has become a pretty powerful instrument in terms of enter expertise, rather, relationships, reputation, and performance, especially in times of the uh, uh, recent pandemic and the global adversities. In many cooperative integration efforts, innovation and digital transformation were imperative given the current and emerging technological innovations that uh, are taking place in banking and uh, commerce. This will help them adapt quickly to the changing external environment enable the business climate, especially the micro and small cooperatives, and survive the highly uncertain and competitive market. So this is how I look at things based on that question. Thank you so much for that. And coming to uh, near the close, but one more, one more question uh, of substance I'd really like to get into. And we talked previously about the drivers and food security and, and um, or food insecurity. And one of, the, one of them that came up earlier was climate change we touched on. I'd like to get into that a little bit deeper. When it comes to climate change in the region, and uh, you don't need to be, um, you don't need to be necessarily a, a climatologist or a scientist to to see the effects that are happening around the region, particularly um, you know, in Southeast Asia and the impact increased droughts and floods and and um, and the, and the impact that it's having with food production in particular. We're specifically looking at the Philippines and across ASEAN, and given the, the the global food crisis that we've seen as well that's been playing out, what are the opportunity costs for governments? And what's being lost for governments in the region if they don't implement climate adaptation and mitigation measures for farmers, specifically the introduction of seeds that can cope with adverse weather conditions, crop insurance, technology, et cetera. What are, what are, the, what are the threats and, and, again, the opportunity, opportunity costs, what's going to be lost for governments if they don't take action to support farmers in some of these, um, in some of these respects? Okay. Uh, well, I'm not an expert uh, in climate change. Uh, but uh, maybe I can uh, make some uh, connecting dots, okay, based on my previous answers, as uh, how this, what you call non-adoption non, uh, of uh, the so-called mitigating measures and adaptive measures uh, would impact, okay, economically and socioeconomically. We know that, uh, well, uh, climate change refers to uh, long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. And in fact, the intergovernmental panel in climate change that is the IPCC, has made projections on the impacts of climate change on food, water, ecosystems, and uh, extreme weather. For instance, an increase in global temperature of just 1%, uh, 1 degree centigrade, I think uh, this is, has been circulated in so many literatures already, 
And the literature says that it will melt some glaciers as well as threaten water supply in the many areas. There will also be extensive damage to coral reefs and rising intensity of storms, floods, forest fires, what else? We have droughts and uh, yeah, even heat waves. Further increases in temperature can lead to sea level rise that will, um, will uh, inundate major cities in the world. So climate change have wide ranging and uncertain effects on health and food security, livelihood and income, and uh, even displacement of vulnerable communities. Health impacts can be in the form of increased morbidity and mortality risk arising from water and vector-borne diseases, as well as incidents of uh, pulmonary and, uh, well, what, how do you call that? Cardiovascular illnesses. Threats on food security and poverty may arise from reduced crop yields, as well as animal, livestock, and fish productivity that could uh, in turn also lead to malnutrition and poor health among the vulnerable population. Adverse effects on marine ecosystems will affect the livelihood of households who are dependent on fishing. All these present opportunity costs to governments in the region if climate change mitigation and adaptation activities are not implemented, particularly in developing countries that are bound to ex experience much of the adverse impact of climate change. So what we're saying here is that uh, we don't pay so much attention on this and we just think about the expenses uh, that will go into uh, engaging to uh, similar concerns like this. There will be more uh, cost, okay, once we experience the upper effects of uh, uh, what you call uh, disregarding the threat that is uh, being uh, given to us by this uh, climate change. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Again, I, I greatly appreciate your perspective on that. It's a tough, uh, tough topic and one that uh, I think you know, farmers around the region and, and certainly um, other stakeholders as well are grappling with and how we how we can really support the farmers in a, in a bigger way on that front. So a lot to do. So we've come to the last question in this first episode of our of our second season, and we'd like to uh, with that maybe lighten things up a little bit. We talked about some very serious and tough topics. Uh, <laughs> we, but one of the things we do talk about we talk about the smallholder the, the farmers a lot. Um, and with with, uh, with with good reason, and keeping that in mind, we also give thanks to those farmers for the work they do to help drive food security and trade, but also for for ingredient for growing rather all the ingredients that we uh, that we need for all the good food that we enjoy in, in this region. So, so in that, in that spirit and kind of a little bit of levity with the last question, I wanted to ask: Is there a favorite regional food that you have? Uh, a favorite dish or favorite food that comes to mind when you think about uh, again? The role the farmers play and uh, something that you enjoy to eat. Yeah, I love eating, and uh, you know, <laughs> it makes really uh, the uh, the daily routine different when you see different food items. But when you talk about regional, can I go beyond Asia? Uh, because I really love the Japanese food, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I have to limit it to just uh, our region. No, no, uh, that, how, could, that 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 definitely that definitely qualifies. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so. Now, uh, I'm picking uh, the Japanese food for uh, a number of reasons. First, uh, well, I did my uh, doctoral degree in, in Japan, so many say I've been exposed to their food. And it's not only the taste, but uh, also I consider uh, its safety, the manner by which they prepare, okay, the freshness of the food. Uh, they're not really that expensive if you, if you know where to go for, uh, for those food. And uh, and also they have a very strong uh, what you call consumer rights, and so if something goes wrong, uh, uh, you are protected uh, by uh, simply expressing what you think about the food. And uh, of course, I would like to thank those who have uh, been uh, laboring so hard. And I always ask my students uh, and remind them that uh, whenever they eat uh, outside, they better uh, be sure to uh, order the right food and uh, finish them because there's so much effort devoted by farmers producing these, uh, these food items, and that uh, they should be uh, thankful to uh, the, our heroic uh, uh, farmers for uh, doing their share in this uh, developmental process. Did I answer the food item? Absolutely. No, you did. You got me you're actually hungry for lunch now, thinking about, uh, <laughs> thinking about maybe some sushi based on that answer. So, well, 
That's terrific. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, Catello, thank you. You're officially off the five good questions hot seat. Thank you so much again for your, uh, your time and your insights today. We look, hope, look forward to hopefully talking again soon. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And if you did, please rate, review, and subscribe. We look forward to bringing you another five good questions interview. 